Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Lauren Izo. And coming up in this edition. Are we on the way to a nationwide lockdown? Numbers continue to spike as Israel grapples with the battle against COVID-19. Then, first the UAE, now Kosovo. What other countries are on their way to normalization with Israel? We have an expert standing by. And it's too hot for rain this time of year, but something else is falling from the sky over Tel Aviv. Something you might not expect. We begin with an attempted stabbing attack in the West Bank. The IDF reporting the incident taking place near the West Bank town of Ariel. An assailant drawing a knife attempting to stab a soldier but unsuccessfully. There were no injuries in that attack and the attacker was arrested shortly after the incident. Well, as numbers spike unprecedentedly in Israel, the health ministry is looking for new strategies in the battle against COVID-19. Lawmakers on Thursday approving a citywide lockdown for 30 municipalities across the country. More in the next report. Over the weekend, Israel surpassed 1,000 deaths as a result of COVID-19. I am very much concerned. We are in the of Israel's Prime Minister also announcing that several municipalities would enter a lockdown beginning Monday after a single day's infection rate topped 3,000 cases. Coronavirus Commissioner Professor Roni Gamzu said that total lockdowns were only expected to be placed on 8 to 10 of the country's reddest communities, while night lockdowns and other severe restrictions would be implemented on the less severe areas. Under these new measures, residents will be prohibited from venturing more than 500 meters away from home, except for the supply of food, medicine, and other essential house maintenance needs. All non-essential businesses will be shuttered. Educational institutions will be closed, except for kindergartens and special education, and travel to, within, and from the cities, and even certain neighborhoods, will be restricted. <laughs> The restrictions are set to come into effect on Monday and the list of localities that will be placed under lockdown to be finalized today. Nitney Manson, ILTV. Dr. Amnon Lahad is the chairman of the Department of Family Medicine at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he joins us now. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Please start by telling us from firsthand experience, how are the hospitals keeping up with the cases? Are they overwhelmed? So um, they are busy, but not overwhelmed. Um, Till now, the number of uh, acute cases and people on respirator are still within the ability of the hospital. Uh, I'm afraid what will be next, and to be honest, we are talking too much on uh, the hospital, not that they are not important, but also the community clinics when uh, winter will come and influenza and uh, 
uh, corona viruses will be around, uh, the barrier of the uh, primary care clinics uh, will not be able to hold, and then the hospital will fail, definitely. Sir, do you believe that a lockdown is the right thing to do, and is it going to make a difference if there's a partial lockdown or a lockdown on the whole country? Uh, I think that uh, a lockdown is uh, only a solution uh, when you have nothing else to offer. Uh, probably a lockdown for all of the country is the wrong thing. There is a difference of about tenfold between cities with uh, low incidence of the uh, disease and cities or municipalities with high incidence. So to have one measure for all of them is, is wrong. Uh, so uh, we probably need to do the lockdown only in places that are really heavy in, uh, in, in uh, with corona and also areas that people do not keep the rules. Uh, that's the main thing. If we were 100% sure that everyone will keep the rules that uh, you keep on the mask, you don't gather, especially in a closed room and things like that, uh, we will probably need less of a lockdown. Uh, and areas that do not keep the rules uh, on average need more of a lockdown. So currently, the idea of taking only the very high areas of uh, infectious and to do the lockdown there makes sense. Do you think that we are going to see the numbers continue to rise? When will we? When can we expect that there will be a peak? I mean, it's what everyone's waiting for, right? It's a, it's a thing that no one really knows the answer for that. Uh, everyone manipulate and say, oh, uh, the herd immunity, we will get there when 50% of the population will get infected or 30% uh, or 70%. And no country got to herd immunity yet. And the other thing, we don't know if we will keep the herd immunity for a long time or only for a few weeks or months, uh, meaning that people can be or uh, reinfected and we don't know it. Uh, uh, it seems that we still have a place to go, and the number, if we will not do something drastic, can increase. We are currently at 3,000 uh, new cases, most of them with uh, younger people, but 3,000 new cases a day in Israel, which give us uh, the championships. Uh, we have, uh, uh, according to the size of our population, the highest rate of infectious uh, currently, and it's not a good place to be in. Right. Also, the Jewish high holidays are uh, swiftly approaching, and that's a time where, you know, people like to gather. Do you think that we can expect a countrywide lockdown during that time? Uh, maybe. And the reason to say maybe it depends what uh, will be uh, the religious leader probably, uh, if they will agree uh, that Kol Nidre, the uh, most important prey uh, in the eve of Yom Kippur, uh, people will do it at home or gather in a synagogue. Usually it's the most crowded time in the synagogues and uh, everyone is very, very, very near to the other. Right. Uh, and there is also praying standing, which means that you are ability to infect other people is higher. Uh, if uh, they will not agree that the praise will be done in a different way, there will be no other way but to do a lockdown. All right, Dr. Amnon Lahad, thank you so much for your insight. Meanwhile, for 11 consecutive weeks, protesters gathering in Jerusalem to demonstrate against Prime Minister Netanyahu, the corruption charges against him and his government's handling of the pandemic. Thousands came out on Saturday to demand change, and 12 protesters were arrested. Now here it's a protest against the government, and a lot of people are coming here for different reasons. Some people are coming here to protest the, the police violence, some people are coming here to protest the, the corruption, maybe corruption. But uh, the thing that uh, unites everyone is the government, that everyone wants the government to change. 
uh, because there's a lot of unemployment in the country and because of the handling of the coronavirus. I came here in order to make uh, Bibi Netanyahu uh, go away. We are tired, uh, that's enough. We don't want him anymore. From corruption to historic peace agreements, after the deal with the United Arab Emirates, more countries are on the way to normalizing ties with Israel, now European ones. Kosovo has agreed to establish diplomatic ties with Israel and will, along with Serbia, open an embassy in Jerusalem. Also, the new president of Malawi announcing plans to open a diplomatic office in Jerusalem, a first for an African country. In addition, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia has officially confirmed in a statement that they will allow Israeli commercial airplanes to fly through their airspace. Now, to break this down, Middle East expert Dr. Moti Kedar joins us. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Pleasure. Now, let's start with the Middle East. Does this confirmation by Saudi Arabia that Israel can cross its airspace mean that an actual peace deal might be on the way? Well, I think that the Saudis and the Emiratis before them, and the Israeli, of course, want to give Trump the credit for bringing peace to the Middle East, as we see, in order to enhance his chances to win in the elections of the beginning of, uh, of uh, November. Because all these countries, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and more, want Trump to continue in office in order to continue the pressure on Iran not to join again the JCPOA and, of course, not to lift the sanctions on Iran. And therefore, they are now in some kind of a hurrying up in order to, to shape like what looks like a peace in the Middle East as wide as possible in order to give Trump this credit of being the sponsor of this peace. Why is it in Kosovo's interest to establish ties with Israel? And will Serbia follow after this embassy move? Well, is Israel waited because Kosovo already as an Islamic state, which is like half the size of Israel, which is not big to begin with. And Kosovo declared its statehood in February of 2008, uh, almost 13 years ago. But Israel refrained so far from recognizing Kosovo because of two reasons. One is Israel didn't want uh, to hurt its relations with uh, Serbia, which was always against the declaration of independence of Kosovo, because Israel and Serbia are very tightly connected. Secondly, Israel did not want to legitimize something like declaring of statehood because it actually legitimizes the Palestinian statehood as well. But since now Serbia and Kosovo decided to recognize each other, so Israel has nothing to lose if Israel will recognize Kosovo. It's not a peace agreement because we never had a war with Kosovo. Kosovo was not a state un until now, or at least until recently. And what we have is, uh, is mutual recognition of an Islamic state named Kosovo and, um, and, and, and Israel. And apparently Israel made, a, made a, a condition that Israel will go forward with these relations uh, in condition that the embassy of Kosovo will be in Jerusalem rather than in Tel Aviv or other cities. Right. So here we are, it's like a package deal with, this, again, the sponsorship of America, because America has already recognized Kosovo already in 2008, or at least uh, implicitly. I do want to touch on that U.S. involvement. As you were saying before, and as we can see from those images, clearly Trump has been the one largely negotiating these deals. I'm wondering, how involved is Netanyahu? And would this wave of peace deals have been possible at all had Trump not been in the White House? Well, I do have the, the feeling that Netanyahu is deeply uh, invested in these things, in these uh, developments and with the Emirates, with the Saudis, maybe the Sudanis and the uh, Omanis and the Bahrainis, and of course, with the, with the Kosovars uh, as well. Don't forget that this kind of recognition, mutual recognition, is not something which is decided upon between yesterday and today. It is something which you work on for years, and Netanyahu was there for years to work on it, and now it came to a fruition. 
I'm wondering who could be next. You know, you just mentioned Sudan. We heard that Sudan might be on the way to normalization with Israel, but for the last couple of weeks, no update on that. Now Malawi, more African countries on the way. What can we expect? Look, don't forget the, the ties between Chad and is another Islamic country in the sub-Sahara area, uh, which already the president visited Israel, visited, and I think Netanyahu also visited Chad. Uh, and, and you, know, you know, these countries, first of all, they, ne they never had any, connect any struggle with Israel, unlike Jordan, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon. F second thing, they are not Arabs. They are Muslims, but they are not Arabs. And in, especially in Kosovo and in Malawi, their Islam is, I would uh, phrase it as Islam light. Uh, they do not care so much about this. All Nobody right. really talks about it. A lot of very interesting points. Dr. Moti Kedar, thank you so much, as always. No problem. Well, speaking of normalization, the heads of Israel's two biggest banks will travel to the United Arab Emirates this month, the first such visit since the two countries announced this historic peace deal. One delegation led by Bank Apoalim will leave on September 8th and visit Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and the chairman and CEO of Bank Leomi will head a second delegation on September 14th. Bank Leomi said it hoped to build a, on the diplomatic accord by kickstarting cooperation in finance, technology, health, tourism, agriculture, and industry. Tel Aviv is hosting a startup boot camp where innovation is the name of the game. Hundreds of aspiring entrepreneurs, professionals, and job seekers will have 24 hours to brainstorm and workshop more than 100 startup ideas. And it's all happening next week. Yossi Dan joins me now to explain the idea behind this event. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So tell us, how did you develop this idea? Why did you decide to start this event? We are, we are doing boot camps for years. You know, with, with big companies, Danone, Nestle, Google, for, for many years in Israel physical events and then we have all faced you know the the, the covid cri crisis and we knew that one million israelis are stuck at home we decided to move our events to something online and this is what we are doing so it's way more accessible for everyone now obviously yeah. okay so take me through the day what is going to happen during the event how does it work okay so it's it's 24 hours yeah you know beside the break for the night yeah <laughs> But we begin at uh, 6 p.m. Okay. until 6 p.m. On the, on, the, on the second day. Okay. And we have every, all the steps from the ideation and working on the product and on the solution and on the marketing and on the pitch. At the end of the day, we'll have the best teams uh, in, front of, of, in front of big investors that will present the ideas. And there's mentors working with them along the way? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's, it's actually, you know, 24 hours, we have a fantastic support from the ecosystem. So we do have more than 20 partners and more than 50 mentors wow. that will actually escort the teams. So the teams, every time that we have our five sprint sessions where we work with the, with the entrepreneurs, the, the, the teams are just escorted by dozens of mentors that took from their time to come pro bono. Everything is wow. free and pro bono to help those people. Can you give us maybe some examples of some of the or some of the mentors that are going to be part of the program, maybe from some high-profile startups in Israel? <laughs> so I, I can tell you first that we have, uh, uh, you know, our big uh, uh, partners, Google for Startups, wow. WeWork, Microsoft for Startups, or Cloud. So all those big, you know, names all the big ones. Come, come, come with the, with the startups. So what, what I do like is that we, have, we do have also, you know, the the Israeli startups that grow, all those unicorns alike. So I can say now that we really will have people from Fiverr, from Wix, wow. and others that will uh, come and support the aspiring entrepreneurs. So these entrepreneurs, when they uh, sign up for this event, do they have to come with an idea sort of already formed in their mind, or are they doing everything as a part of this workshop? So this is a good question, Lauren, because we, we wanted to make it very, very open. So people come as they are. Some of them have ideas, and we know how to work with, and some, some of them don't have some ideas. And, and we have them to decide, we have them to put, to team up, and have you know, those people uh, being able to work with others on, on the ideas. So it's, it's very, very open, and, and we want it also to, to, to have 
Olim, to have job seekers, you know, not only the hackers, coders, the ones that usually do it. Right. We want to open that to the whole market. We know that we have one million Israelis stuck at home without salaries. So we are, you know, we are the, the light side <laughs> of this crisis. We want to initiate 100 new startup projects. So you want to initiate 100 new projects in 24 hours. I mean, to me, that sounds very ambitious. Why 24 hours? And do you think that it's going to happen? <laughs> so we did it before. <laughs> OK. We did it before, not in that scale, of okay. course, not in that scale. We, we cannot, it's, it's not launching startups, of course, but we can actually do early validation on startup ideas. You, you know, all those people don't have attention from, from those investors and, and big companies. So we wanted, we wanted to come pro bono for a free event and give them during 24 hours the attention that, you know, that they deserve. And, and after those 24 hours, they will, they will have lots of information for them to decide if they jump into it or not yet, or any, anything they decide. Right. And those 24 hours are usually enough to make those decisions. So if our viewers, say, want to get involved in this event, is it too late? And how can they get more information about it? OK, so we are actually opening together with ILTV. We are, we are opening our big registration period three, three days until Tuesday midnight. People can apply, come to our uh, website and click on apply. They can apply as individual if they are alone, or they can apply as a team. And actually, I have a small tip. When you apply as a team, it's way better to be, to be, to be accepted as, as a participant. So even if this is you know, with, with colleagues, friends, potential future co-founders, Come as a team is, is way better. Well, I hope our viewers that are interested in participating listened to your tip, Yossi Dan. <laughs> Thank you so much, and best of luck with this. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Well, according to research by Tel Aviv University, Israel's sea creatures are being contaminated by pharmaceuticals. A study showing various marine life forms from 10 different research sites located along Israel's coastline were found to have a significant concentration of medical drugs residue within their systems. Professor Noah Shankar, who headed the study, says there could be irreversible ecological damage that would harm the fish themselves, as well as all those who eat fish. It's not a bird or a plane or cats and dogs. It's marijuana. Last week in Tel Aviv, a drone launched hundreds of baggies of cannabis from the sky to the confusion of onlookers. The stunt was organized by activists fighting for the drug to be legal. Israel police arrested the two men following the drop and released a statement alleging the men were distributing a dangerous drug. Currently, medical use of cannabis is permitted in Israel, while recreational use is illegal but largely decriminalized. If you were in or around Jerusalem on Thursday, as I was, you'll know just how hot it was. In fact, the temperature broke records. Israel's capital saw the hottest day since 1942 at 42.3 degrees Celsius or 108 Fahrenheit. Yes, you heard that right. And then on Friday, it was even hotter, reaching 42.8 degrees Celsius or 109 degrees Fahrenheit. Additionally, extreme heat, humidity, and dry spells were recorded throughout the country. OK, on that note, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be a low of 26 degrees Celsius or 79 degrees Fahrenheit. And tomorrow will be a high of 32 degrees Celsius or 89 degrees Fahrenheit. And before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. That was, of course, Netta Barzilai, Israel's winner from Eurovision. She was doing a Disney sing-along from Mary Poppins, one of my favorite musicals. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.37 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, Follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Lauren Izo.
Thanks for watching.